looking forward to this one because we have a slightly different approach to addressing a very important issue within this industry. It's called the Market Leaders Academy. Here's the thing. There is the dawn of a new era when it comes to market funding. Chris Seymour is going to lead this, so I'm going to introduce him now, then he'll bring on his panel. So with that, please join me in welcoming the Regional Development Director and Head of Markets for the Middle East and South Asia with Mott McDonald, Chris Seymour. Chris, join us, please. Hey, Chris. Nice to see you. Do you need this weapon? Uh, I do not. No. You do not. I'll take it with me then. Keep it safe. Thank you very much, uh, Richard, and good afternoon, uh, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. And first of all, a big thank you for delaying your lunch uh, to watch this, uh, in what I think is a very important session. Um, it, clearly, where the money starts is going to be one of the key aspects of your project and probably the most important. And I suppose the emerging markets have always been a unique place when it comes to project funding, always had its challenges over many years, uh, and the Middle East in particular over the last three years. Uh, has really clearly seen significant change and what we've called the new era of project funding. Our session this afternoon is looking at this new era, what's changed and what the practical options are. We're going to be looking at uh, contractor financing, we're going to be looking at um, uh, ECA and many other options. And we've also styled this, as Richard says, as an academy. And so we're going to be explaining the jargon and breaking down the acronyms so that you really have a learning experience before you head out to lunch and have hopefully uh, improved quality conversations between uh, yourselves. Now to help me with this task, I'm joined by a, I think what you'd call a world-class panel of experts. And I'd therefore like you to welcome to the stage, first of all, uh, Mohammed Bin Gatti, uh, CEO of Bin Gatti Holdings. Uh, a warm welcome, please, for uh, Hamid. Thank you very much. Uh, if you. If you haven't already, if you're not already living in one of their developments, you'd have certainly seen them on the, uh, on the awards circuit. Uh, secondly, uh, Cyril Lincoln, Head of Real Estate for Abu Dhabi uh, Commercial Bank. Again, a warm welcome, please. Thank you. If, uh, if, if Cyril doesn't get the bank involved in, uh, in, in one of the deals, he has this uh, knack of certainly knowing, uh, knowing what's happened with all the, uh, with all the competitors. Uh, our very own uh, Russell Dallas, uh, Global Practice Leader, uh, for project finance for Mark McDonald. He's going to be giving a little bit of an international context so that we can understand what's happening uh, outside these shores. And last but certainly not least, uh, Amir Ahmad, uh, partner at Pinson's Masons, uh, specializing in real estate finance. Thank you, gentlemen. And um, throughout this session, I'm going to be taking uh, questions. So if you do have a question um, in the conventional uh, manner, uh, put up your hand, and uh, hopefully we can get a microphone to you, and, uh, and we'll take that question. Um, is this on? Yes, it is. Uh, so I'd just like to start, actually, with quite a... Uh, I'm going to start with quite a basic question, um, and that's to, uh, to Cyril. If we cast our minds forward, uh, and if, indeed, if we were lucky enough to be sitting here uh, uh, three years ago, I'd like you to describe to us what the uh, project funding environment was like then, and then uh, cast your mind forward to where we are now, and just explain uh, to the audience what, the, uh, what has actually changed in that period, apart from everything, of course. Good morning, and thank you. Um, thank you for the introduction. Um, I think uh, we've had some very good uh, uh, presentations already this morning from, uh, from the economist perspective, from the YouGov research, um, and of course, uh, a number of the other uh, speakers we've had. But essentially, um, we've seen the graphs that show us that real estate prices uh, have, have declined. Um, I'd like to describe that more as a, a, a soft landing or a correction in the market. So we've seen that. Uh, we've seen EBOR three years ago, the, the interbank uh, lending rate um, has gone from approximately 60 basis points. It's now approximately 1.5%. So EBOR has risen in line with the LIBOR increases. Um, and we've also seen a lot of uh, consolidation of businesses in the market, not least of which the consolidation of uh, the two large banks in Abu Dhabi, FGB and uh, NBAD, of course. So we've seen consolidation, we've seen prices redu reducing. Um, and I think if I had to put in a nutshell what is causing uh, the, the headwinds in this market, it's really a product of dollar strength. So on a relative basis, 
um, because the, uh, the, the obviously dirham and the GCC currencies are pegged to the dollar, the relative dollar strength compared to other major, major currencies during the past three years has really been what has made um, the UAE in particular and Dubai relatively expensive uh, destination. And we've seen this in whether we look at uh, consumer prices, whether we're uh, consuming in the shopping centers or hotel prices or even real estate prices, which is of course what we're talking about. So I think uh, the market has responded to that. So the slight uh, correction in, in prices that we've seen is now what's really causing the uh, um, uh, market to continue to, to deliver. And we've seen all the statistics, so I won't uh, uh, rehash those. Um, I think if I can add a few more points, really we've seen a much more uh, maturing market in terms of our regulatory environment. Um, just the, the existence of DIFC, the RERA regulations, the real estate laws, all of this as a package for the investment market um, really creates an a, um, uh, environment where business can transact. And the fact that we've seen a relatively soft landing uh, you know, the correction in the market is evidence of this maturing uh, market. Okay, and so, uh, uh, Amir, maybe I can turn to you on that. What has happened? Has the market become more sophisticated in terms of the options that are available? It was um, uh, in, in, previous, uh, in previous years, we always had a very basic uh, market, quite, um, quite simple in terms of project funding. Um, because of the, uh, the, the oil price and, and the dollar strength which followed it, which uh, Cyril has talked about, have we become more sophisticated in terms of the options that are available? Could you just uh, give us some pointers on that? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Um, sophistication is quite, a, quite an interesting word, right? Um, I mean, what does it mean? I think we have, um, I mean, if you look at 10 years ago and if you look at now in relation to the regulatory framework in Dubai particularly, a lot of changes has, have, have, have occurred. Um, so what we have seen is we have seen the escrow law come into place, right? So what it basically boils down to is that, you know, debt that is incurred in relation to a project goes into a project and not to buy a Bentley or a Ferrari, for example, right? Um, in 2016, we saw the new pledge law come into effect. Uh, that's quite an interesting law, uh, and it basically identifies certain asset classes and on those asset classes, you can take something what we call registrable security. So you can take collateral on those assets, and then it's going to be clear to everyone else that you have encumbered those assets. So that's another development. A further development uh, was the introduction of the bankruptcy law in 2016. Um, prior to that, uh, prior to 2016, the bankruptcy provisions were scattered around in a couple of uh, couple of laws and regulations in the UAE. Now it's all been centralized. And what that law does, what the bankruptcy law does, uh, basically it is to provide a procedure um, to deal with corporate insolvencies. Um, it also creates something what, be, what is similar to basically a chapter 11 sort of um, uh, variant, as we know from the US. Uh, called a um, uh, protective composition scheme. So it gives corporates a breathing room when they're in financial difficulty to be able to you know, do the work that they, that, that they were doing without being uh, scared of um, you know, having bankruptcy uh, proceedings against them. And perhaps one of the, uh, one of the most significant uh, reg pieces of regulation that came in 2015 is the new PPP law, right? Uh, and that it basically creates the legal framework for a partnership between the private sector and the Dubai public sector, right? Now, there are certain exclusions into that, into that law. So the, the, the diva bit is excluded, water and, uh, and electricity bit ex is excluded, uh, but, it, uh, but it provides a lot of framework in relation to introducing uh, some, of the, you know, some of the PPP models that we are familiar with in, 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 in the UK. Uh, for example, the concessions, the BOTs, the BOT, OOTs, the BO, BTOs, um, it cre this law creates a further condition um, for some of the things that need to be put into a concession agreement, uh, quite similar to what it is in the UK. Um, and basically, I think the PPP law is an excellent tool 
um, you know, to, um, uh, to lighten the physical burden. So there has been a lot of changes. I don't know if that has been um, a sophistication, but certainly okay. a change. And um, do you think, um, as far as PPP is concerned, in, ter in terms of the relevance of the real estate market, we've got a, uh, very much a, a real estate contingent here. Um, what relevance does that have to this market? Is it really around the, uh, the, the TOD type development, or is there, is, is there something more relating to that? Yeah, um, I mean, if you look at the real estate market, you have to make a distinction between the GRE real estate market and lending into the GRE real estate market, which is not really a real estate market, surreal, because you're taking a GRE risk as it is, right? Um, and the private real estate market. Uh, and uh, these changes have really helped the private real estate developers get funding okay. uh, because they can identify real collateral that they can give to banks as uh, as, as security, um, it, it gives them uh, the framework within which they can, um, you know, they can do the composition, uh, composite, uh, uh, protective composition screen, right, to, to isolate themselves in relation to financial difficulty. The escrow law provides, uh, you know, how additional cash flow can be used, how some of those dividends can be used to enhance financial propositions. Okay, and do, and do you think that, um uh, the uh, something I want to come on to. Do you think the PPP law has actually encouraged international banks to become more involved in this particular region here? Do you think that has been something that's been attractive to them? Um, absolutely. Um, uh, so, um, just to give you an example, you know, um, I mean, I've been doing project finance for the last uh, 19 years, and in this region, whenever there was a project finance proposition put to the table, the international banks, one of the first questionnaires they had was, "What is the regulatory framework?" And the answer to that was there is none, right? So, so just tick that box is going to help, you know, uh, some of those international banks um, uh, come into the market, and you're already seeing some of those okay, banks so, lend into so the market. So, what you're saying is it's a matter of the, the the regulation you were talking about. It's something that's a much more. Not only is it fit, does it feel safer and lower risk, it is also a matter that it feels a much more familiar environment. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, uh, Russell, um, uh, your your turn certainly to come in here. So um, here we all are, uh, sitting in the uh, sitting in the Middle East, um, uh, feeling that the market is becoming more attractive to international banks. Um, from your perspective, you've got a global remit. What are the international banks saying about the Middle East? In other words, are they are they would would you say they're favouring that over the Far East? How does that actually work? Yeah. Thanks, Chris. So, I think, in addition to international banks, it would probably group in maybe even equity providers, institutional uh, investors, funds, funds of funds, and, and generally call them just an international investment group. I, I think the PPP point aside, which is a very important point, is a facilitator and something of a catalyst. And, and the regulatory um, encouragement that gives. If I was to consider one general sort of phrase that would summarize the sentiment, it's it's probably cautiously optimistic, I would say, um, for most international providers. And, the, and I think the reason for that is, well, I, I suppose some of the, the negatives that we've heard from our client base over maybe a number of years now is um, there was maybe some issues around the uh, contestability and, and competition and sort of transparency of some of the ambitions in real estate and infrastructure. Um, we touched on the regulation point. I think there were some concerns in, in, in understanding just the contract mechanisms and financing arrangements. And in the event of some of those uh, deals delaying or getting into distress, there was some confusion or difficulty with some of the penal arrangements in that, all of which led to sort of an increased cost of capital quoted and probably a reluctance to dedicate a lot of resource to the region. And I think one of the, the, the key things to remember here is that this region, like any other, is in competition. And the, you know, there is increased uh, pools of liquidity available globally. And the conventional wisdom is from those people that say they have that is that there are not enough projects. Or projects are not structured in the right way, or parties are not acting in the true spirit of partnership, or thinking maybe elastically enough around alternative funding structures. And my own personal view is, Probably some of that is, is quite correct. But there is increasing curiosity to understand if uh, deal structures here are considering all the options. And I'm talking about funding options here, not financing. From availability funding to revenue funding, end user 
or some combined models, um, at-risk pre-sales funding combined with maybe some institutional money. So you're talking, you, you referred there to um, uh, cautious optimism and, and uh, curiosity. Uh, we were discussing this a little bit before the, uh, before the session and we were uh, trying to understand really the, I suppose, the predominance of interest in the Far Eastern markets um, as opposed to the Middle East markets. But of course, a number of the, uh, what we'd call international banks sitting here are actually Far Eastern banks, uh, Standard Chartered, one of them HSBC uh, and some Japanese, uh, Japanese banks as well. I'll, and I was just curious to know, uh, put your hand up if you're from any one of those three banks I've just mentioned. I can't see anybody with their hand no, up. There, uh, there is just there, one. There's one tentative. Uh, yeah. uh, one tentative. Okay. <laughs> uh, maybe we'll get a microphone over to you uh, to you shortly to um, find out whether you're uh, cautious or curious. Um, uh, but let's bring it back down to earth a bit, uh, Mohammed. I've got uh, you. You are. Um, you've developed uh, around 30 projects uh, across across Dubai. Um, so bluntly, uh, a what are the uh, what are the main funding routes that you use and Equally, what would you expect um, your other uh, developer colleagues to also uh, consider in, a, uh, in a, um, a real estate development, the type of development that you undertake yourself? Well, personally, we're, we're quite conservative as a group, but you know, going back to basics or fundamentals, uh, essentially what we'd rely on, or perhaps you'd see other developers relying on, is releasing equity. So essentially existing assets owned by, by the group being mortgaged to uh, banks and uh, essentially getting financing in that fashion. We've also seen uh, quite a few developers, especially the, the big names out there, going into JVs with each other and uh, you know, financing each other, let's say, if you like. Um, perhaps another way is to uh, finance the land or mortgage, mortgage the land and, and get financing from that route. Uh, and then one of the more creative ways that we've seen most recently in the market as a trend both you know, locally and globally is the idea of real estate funds or REITs if you like. So essentially uh, one of the models that we personally used in, in, in a few projects is to offload the asset at an early stage during construction and uh, receiving payments based on construction milestones. So essentially that makes your, you know, your cash flows easier and it helps in financing the project. And uh, perhaps one of the other options which we've seen used uh, quite a few times is to essentially launch off-plan sales and uh, after, after reaching a specific uh, percentage of construction and uh, using those proceeds in order to finance your project. Okay, so um, the, you, you started there with what we'd probably call quite a traditional approach, in other words, uh, leveraging your, your current assets, but then you picked up the, uh, the opportunity to actually use uh, real, estate, uh, real Estate Investment Trust. Um, there's, uh, there is one uh, right out there at the moment, ENBD REIT, um, which uh, if, if you want to understand how that's structured, um, ask, somebody on that, ask somebody on that stand. It is, um, it's certainly an interesting model, and uh, maybe we've got, if we can take a question later, we can go, uh, we can go through how that, uh, uh, that actually works. One of the questions I kept, keep getting asked, however, is really around the capacity to lend. And that's relating to not just uh, the, uh, the, the local, uh, local banking environment, but also, I guess, in, in terms of the international uh, international banks. So I'm going to go straight to um, uh, straight to Cyril here. You, you should definitely know the answer to this. Um, I, I want you to uh, describe first of all what is the capacity to lend, and which metrics should we be actually looking at to try to judge the headroom that local banks have got. And you can refer to central bank regulations also if you would like. And don't forget, we're in an academy session, so please uh, give everybody a learning uh, a learning experience around this. So. Um it's, it's, a, it's a large question, but I'll attempt to, uh, to, to address some of the key points that, that I think are relevant. Um, do, the, do the bank, does, let's first look at the local banking system. Does the banking system have capacity to, to adequately finance uh, the, the ambitious, uh, you know, the growth ambitions uh, that, that have, we have in Dubai alone, let alone uh, the wider GCC? I think the banks, so I'll just start with the banks. I think the banks are in relatively good shape given uh, the, the slowdown in the market. If you just look at all the half-year results, uh, you'll see 
relatively uh, good protection of margin, good protection of uh, you know, good behavior in terms of managing uh, non-performing assets. So I think the banks are in fairly good shape. I think there's a reasonable uh, amount of liquidity in the banking system. Uh, if we just think about the, the increasing uh, EBOR rates and the recent sort of geopolitical events, flight to quality, this has more or less positively impacted uh, the, the banking system. Um, we also see the banks continually uh, uh, continuing to be able to borrow internationally and to fund themselves with, uh, you know, uh, on, on in global capital markets, and that's a very important uh, uh, support uh, base for everything that uh, all, all the ambitions we are trying to achieve here. So that. The banking uh, system, shall we say, is well regulated and I think in reasonably good shape. We've also seen consolidation in the sector, so obviously I mentioned FGB, NBAD, that creates uh, more scale, more ability to borrow and more capacity to, to underwrite and to provide uh, large amounts of liquidity as we're seeing larger and larger projects. Um, our previous speaker mentioned a billion dollars doesn't buy you much. I would say uh, the new benchmark in, in mega projects is probably the 10 billion dirham mark. Um, we've seen a number of those uh, larger, larger scale projects uh, coming to market. And we do uh, take a deep breath as financiers when we see these large numbers. But I think in the same way that the uh, real estate market has self-regulated in terms of prices and supply and demand and, and uh, easing um, into the market and managing a, a relatively soft landing. I think the banking system and the liquidity will also self-regulate. I would also just add the, the uh, banking system will follow the equity markets. So we heard a little bit uh, earlier now about uh, financial markets, you know, described in, in a basket, the international banks. So as long as uh, the, the equity is leading, uh, these investment projects, I think the banks will follow fairly logically and, and that capacity will, will be there. So I'm fairly uh, cautiously optimistic to share the, the sentiment that, that we can look at the next three, four, five years uh, uh, with the right level of maturity okay, and, and, in the market. You, you mentioned that um, uh, as, as a local bank, you, you are borrowing internationally as many as the local banks are. So I suppose my question to you is, do we need the international banks here or are, are you actually fine as you are? Um, I think the, there's enough space in the market, so I think the Central Bank of UAE has approximately 53 banks uh, licensed in this, in this uh, UAE market. Um, some argue there's too many. Um, I, I don't really think there's such a thing as too many. More is better. There's plenty of opportunity here for everyone. Um, perhaps we can talk a little bit about the, the ECA financing and how that plays into this, uh, into this market, uh, especially the real estate financing yeah, we, market. And we will definitely come yeah. on to that. I just want to reach out to, um, there was a lady um, who put her hand up, um, uh, who's, who's waving her hand saying, she, oh, I just want to, well, one word from you actually, are you cautious or are you optimistic? Um, are you cautious or are you curious? Um, is there a, anybody can get a microphone to you there? You just raise your hand. I just want one word, that's all, don't worry. <laughs> I'm not gonna take you to task on it. I know that, um, are you from Standard Chartered? Actually, I, I had the, the question wrong from the beginning, I okay. think. <laughs> <laughs> not, not, not to worry at all. So Standard, if nobody from Standard Chartered, Standard Chartered yeah. have been here for many years and have actually um, undertaken some pretty um, innovative uh, finance of, uh, of, of real estate projects. So whilst, yes, they do have um, a, a, a big base, a base in the Far East, they definitely uh, have been here and financing, um, uh, and finance, financing real, estate, uh, uh, real estate developments. Um, okay, so uh, Amir, let's get, down to, um, let's get down to practicalities. Let's um, hypothetically um, assume, and I'm sure there may be a few people in this uh, in the audience who can experience or have experienced this. Uh, you have um, a senior lender, you got the offer on the table, um, but it's really unlikely that that's going to come to. The days are gone where it used to come to 100% of the, the loan, and we used to be there 10 years ago. That was uh, what was happening out there. Now you're very lucky to get um, a much smaller percentage of that. Um, okay, so you got your senior lending uh, there. What about the gap? How do you make that up, and what are the options? Okay, um, so the question is, you have a gap of, let's say, 50%, right? Um, and, and, and how do you bridge that? Well, um, 
quite an interesting question. So you look at some of the sources of funding that are available you know, to you, and what would be the sources of funding? You, know, you look at some sort of an equity or something that tastes a bit like equity, smells a bit like equity, what we call quasi-equity, right? Um, uh, so there are a couple of uh, you know, mass providers on the market that can, uh, you know, that can chip you, you know, 10, 15, 20% uh, you know, of, that, of that project cost at a higher, at a higher return. Um, you would look at, uh, you could look at certain uh, export credit agencies, ECAs, and we'll come to how the ECAs uh, operate and within which legal framework they operate and, and, and how you can get ECA funding. Uh, but ECA funding is, uh, is, is, uh, is, is something that you can look at. Um, if the project is, um, is quite large, you could try to do, uh, you know, um, a, a sort of a, a debt capital markets exercise. Um, either through a private placement, um, you know, to certain investors, or you could do a, you could do a public offering. Um, so you have a you have a number of uh, you know sources of debt or quasi debt available. Uh, everything comes at a certain price, Chris. So uh, so pricing is quite important. It is indeed. But to just give the audience some guidance, that other slice that you're talking about, if you were going to lend above the uh, where you need to make the gap up, whether it's around equity or whether it's actually around debt, what sort of number would you be lend borrowing at uh, in terms of just a, just a blank interest rate for that piece? That would be a question more for, more for you on, on, on the pricing, right? Yeah, it's, uh, well, let me tell you, it's going to be well into double figures. Probably, tw what do you think, Cyril, 20? Um, it, it, it's, it's, it's a tough question, and it's the subject of, of a lot of discussion on, on every project that we look at. But I think we, we if I can uh, generally say, we try and lend conservatively enough at the senior level to create that headroom for some additional funding, whether it's a mezzanine loan or, or, or any kind of hybrid financing, not just pure equity. So we do try and keep that gap, and I think the maximum you could, you could think is to close the gap, probably another 20%, yeah. something okay. like that. No, yeah. And maybe just thought. to add so on, on um, because the mass funding is quite ahead. an interesting bit, and just to add on on that, uh, I have seen, uh, um, so on, 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 on the senior bank debt, which is secured, I think you're looking at IBOR plus 300 or 200 bips, right? Uh, um, if you're going to go through um, and, 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 and do sort of a, a mass fund, you really are looking at around 15, uh, north 15% uh, you know, return packed, I guess, right? So okay. I think the 15% the type of pricing is when you really genuinely beyond a senior metric. So if you think that senior could be uh, up to, say, 70%, usually we would lend a little conservatively against that and be, say, at 55 60%. And so if you're topping up up to that 70, you'd probably pay still in the high single digits. And then once you're into the 80 85%, then you could be expecting to pay that 15%. But if you put a big slug of that into your project, your project really won't be able to afford it. So you need to, to work your way through that capital no, I stack. Think, I think that's the point. So it's, um, as, as you get further and further up the scale, it gets more and more, uh, more, and more expensive as the, uh, as the risk uh, increases. This whole thing is not easy. So just coming back to you, uh, uh, Mohammed, um, in, in terms of uh, the, the ways that you actually fund your projects. You mentioned earlier that um, uh, you leverage existing assets. I can understand why you do that, because it makes the whole, the, the whole um, lending piece um, a little bit cheaper. Um, have you considered, um, uh, and you also mentioned the REIT, have you considered um, uh, contractor equity or actually leveraging any other, uh, 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 for example, supply chain um, uh, equity and asset base to, 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 to get to where you need to be? Usually, yes, when the credit facility is there, we do rely on that. Um, however, the, the two main options generally that are available are to, to mortgage the land itself. But the issue with that would be for a developer essentially is to, it, it puts restraints on uh, off-plan sales. So you're, if you're planning to sell the project as an off-plan project in the market, mortgaging the land would put restraints on you as a developer. Uh, so the, the best option or an option that would be better for you as a developer if you were planning that as a process would be to use the existing uh, leverage available to you or to use the facility, uh, inject that into your project and achieve at least a 20% milestone, construction milestone, which essentially enables you to start uh, pulling out uh, cash uh, based on the construction milestone that you've achieved. 
Um, and perhaps uh, the, the third option available to you would be to conduct uh, barter deals based on finished product valuations. So essentially offering finished product at a specific price and offering barter deals with uh, investors. Okay. In uh, thank you. Interesting, um, interesting point, particularly the last one, which we might come uh, back to. I'm going to, um, however, go, go to uh, pick up Russell on the next uh, next point. Uh, Amir picked up the PPP. Okay, so uh, if you like, the, the, the classic description of PPP is where we're involving both the uh, the public sector in terms of public sector asset, but the delivery of it uh, by the private sector. Uh, Transport-oriented development (TOD), as we've um, as we've called it, is certainly gaining a pace here as the region develops more and more no transport nodes. Uh, there's uh, an opportunity around real estate there. Uh, quite an interesting scheme in the UK around King's Cross. I wonder if you could just take us through briefly how that happened and whether actually you think it's uh, applicable here. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Uh, just stepping away from the sort of hard financing for a moment, this story is really about partnership and a vision and a master plan from the outset of various stakeholders sharing in the costs and the benefits of a integrated real estate and infrastructure scheme. So just uh, a bit of context, the King's Cross development in the centre of London is Europe's biggest city centre development. It's a mixed-use regeneration scheme and the ultimate value that's been generated from this, the latest estimate, is something in the order of six to seven billion US dollars. The story began uh, back in the 1990s as a transit scheme. For those that are familiar, King's Cross is the confluence of I think six underground lines and four main railway stations, including a high-speed line that takes the UK into Europe. Uh, and various government bodies and local authorities, local boroughs set up partnership schemes to progress initially the regeneration of the rail lands, and the government had a stake in that up to about 35%. And once that work was uh, planned, approved, permitted, and was going through, a development partner uh, by the name of Argent was brought in with a housing association partner to uh, take up the baton and develop uh, a number of the surrounding lands for property, 50 buildings, um, mixture of office and residential. They have Google's uh, new headquarters there. And the success of the story, really, I think, uh, uh, Chris and delegates, has been built off the back of uh, mutual investment and mutual interest in that partnership model working. Now, there is a hard cost to all of uh, this, ultimately, and, and there's something like uh, 1 billion US out there in terms of senior loans that need uh, serviced over the, over the course of this uh, investment. But interestingly, at the outset, when the developer came on board, obviously in terms of a lot of the facilitative infrastructure works, they had um, the reserves for about a third of the initial 400, 500 million dollars uh, outlay. And a clever partnership was then established with um, a very encouraging set of parties, which I think is a lesson learned here, which was pension fund money and institutional monies. Two significant names that people may recognize in that, um, Hermes Investment Management and Australian Super, which is Australia's biggest superannuation and pension fund scheme. And once they were on board and had been encouraged by the early development, much as was said earlier, whereby uh, initial capital had acted as catalyst for further schemes, then the real true value of the whole area, which is 67 acres, or I think something like eight, 8 million square feet, has been unlocked. And that initial investment, as I said, is now up to around 5 billion. It's created 25,000 uh, jobs. There will be 2,000 uh, affordable housing homes, or sorry, 2,000 homes and a percentage of that affordable housing. And you're looking at servicing now up to about half a million people that live in those two boroughs who've uh, equally benefited and had dividend from that initial investment. And um, at the, as, as you touched on there, one of the interesting parts of that was that as the developer um, it improved the development potential 
overall, they got an increasing discount on the land they were buying. So in a way, uh, they were incentivized to actually maximize the value of that land. And on the, on the other hand, the public purse could be, it could be pretty much guaranteed that they were getting a market rate for, their, uh, for that piece of land. Now that does a, obviously affects the um, ability to, uh, to finance the deal because that was all wrapped up in a special purpose vehicle. So um, a quick um, a response from um, you, Cyril, and then we will get on to um, export credit. Um, but in my previous example, could that work here? Um, I, think, I think we are seeing uh, more activity from the institutional investors here. So um, some of the pension funds uh, in Dubai and Abu Dhabi, institutional money, um, is now finding its way into uh, the market here, either as uh, direct investors in, in finished, you know, completed real estate projects, or um, I think there's an opportunity to to create, uh, um, you know, investment products for them to to channel their their capital and liquidity into to um, to form a base, uh, you know, part of that capital base, which then allows the senior lending. So I think it's still a little embryonic, it's still early days, but I think there's definitely opportunity for that. Okay, and we're going to come on to the, um, uh, the, the, the final piece, um, which uh, I know my panel have been itching to, uh, to, to talk about, and um, uh, Richard is clearly getting hungry as well because he just asked me to try and wrap up as quick as I can. I'm coming, going to come on to um, Export Credit Agency and um, uh, Export Credit Funding. Uh, before I ask the panel about that, could you just, um, is anybody from the DIT here? Put your hand up if you're from the DIT. I can't see it. Oh, yes, there's a, there's a couple uh, that I might actually come back to you in, in a moment. Um, so, uh, Amir, you are on a bit of a time slot here. I need 90 seconds from you. Um, how active are the ECAs in real estate finance, uh, and what part does the UK EF uh, play in this? Uh, I just need to speed you up a bit on that. Yeah. Um, so, the UK ECA is called UKIF, UK Export Finance. Uh, it is uh, very active in, 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 in Dubai. Um, for example, the building that, uh, that we have our offices at is financed by UKIF. Um, um, what you have to bear in mind is that UKIF um, is not a bank, right? Um, its mission, and I'm going to read out, I've had this holding out this paper for a while. UKIF's mission is to ensure that no viable UK export fails for the lack of finance from the, pri from the private sector. So it is to bridge that financing gap. Um, and in, so if I look at the building that we have our offices in and how that is financed, that is financed through one of the means of UKIF, which is called you know, guaranteed a covered facility, whereby they guarantee the payment um, um, you know, to a commercial bank, and there are about 20 commercial banks that participate with UKIF into that scheme that if the borrower the, the employer were not to pay, they would make that, and that so, the payment whole. And so I think what you're saying is it is relevant to real estate. Tell me what the floor is. In other words, what, at what level is export credit an interesting option in terms of the threshold? So for example, 10 million, probably too low, 50 million, 100 million, where is it? Um, so um, in relation to the deals that I've seen in, they are basically around 200 million. 200. Uh, yeah, I think that's probably where it is. So it may be out of scope for uh, a few people here. So I'm going to um, just go to my last, uh, my last question. Actually, I'm going to ask everybody in turn. So I'm going to start back with you, and maybe you can work your way um, towards us. We started talking about 2014, three years ago. I'm going to ask the panel now to cast yourself three years forward. You're on the eve of uh, 2020. Uh, what does project finance look here look like then? And in other words, does it look like something that would be exactly the same in Paris, New York, or London? Or uh, will we really be pretty much in the same place we are now? Amir, you first, and you've got about uh, 15 seconds for your answer. That's me. It is, okay. yeah. Um, I guess it's, yeah, it's, um, I mean, the, the, the PPP law is quite, quite new, right? Um, so we just need to see how that works out and how, mm -hmm. what, a, what sort of comfort it gives to you know, a certain new class of investors coming into the play. So it really is seeing how that develops. Project finance within, for example, Diva has been doing project finance for a very, very long time and, and actually a very successful you know, a procurement of project finance. And so is Advia you know, on, in, in relation to water and, uh, uh, water and electricity. And, and so is Siva uh, for in relation to water and electricity. So it's going to be, it's going to be more about the public-private uh, public, um, uh, partnership. Russell, you next. Yeah. So I think 
going forward, you'll see um, a blend of financing options. I think that's come out today, and I think Cyril's given that confidence that there'll be more parties involved, and I'm pleased to hear that the, the more the better. Traditional uh, financiers with some new financiers with truly deep access to, to capital. Uh, I think uh, the um, environment is there to consider different types of funding uh, and paying for new infrastructure and unlocking, I think, what is a very strong and attractive confluence and convergence between real estate and infrastructure. And I think the keys in all of that, I would maintain, certainly for international participation, are um, transparency and governance and uh, certainty over pipelines such that um, better cost of capital can be focused into the region. Okay, and, uh, and Cyril, you can be as outspoken as you like on this one. Where are you going to be in three years' time? So I think uh, if, if we see how the market has evolved, uh, certainly 10 years ago, five years ago, there was enormous reliance on uh, the traditional banking market. Over the last few years, we've seen the ECA has been more active. More recently, we've seen more capital markets uh, activity, whether it's funds, whether it's the pension funds, um, and other capital markets products. So I think there's, there's scope for that to grow. And I think the, uh, the, the local and regional banking uh, community will continue to play its role. But I think as we see this, this market expanding, and I do continue to believe in that expansion, um, I think the, the, the banks will continue to play a very reliable uh, cornerstone role in that. So I think the, the environment is still conducive to more, more of the same. Okay. And, uh, uh, and Mohammed, um, your, your last perspective on that as the local developer on the panel. As, as a few colleagues, uh, is this working? Does it sound like it? Yeah, it is now. So uh, as a few of my colleagues uh, referred to, two you know, fundamental factors at play here. One is transparency, and uh, the other is the, uh, the sophistication of the market or the, the type of transactions that are happening and the market players. So we've seen a lot of real estate funds coming in. That used to be an international uh, trend, but now we're seeing it more locally. And uh, we're seeing a lot of transparency. So uh, lots of reports being issued for analysts, lots of information being released, which is usually an indicator or, uh, uh, let's say, a, a magnet for uh, international banks to come in and uh, offer lending in the market. I'd just like to um, uh, thank the panel for that, uh, uh, that session. I think we came to, the, um, uh, came to quite, quite a fast halt. If you've got any uh, questions, um, all of these guys are going to be around uh, over your much-deserved uh, lunch, so please um, come and have a chat, uh, and I'm sure we can continue the conversation. And uh, I'm, I'm just about to hand back to Richard, who's standing right next to me with his hand on his hip, looking rather upset. But uh, I've finished this quick as I, I could. am <laughs> never upset when I am in your company, Chris. I have a hunger only for knowledge, and you are a font of it. It's a pleasure to be sharing a stage and a microphone with you, not for the first or the last time. It was a great panel. Thanks very much indeed to Chris and all of our panelists today.